So in the um, in the last part we talked about worlds and levels and units. And uh, today we're gonna focus on entities. So as I said yesterday, entities is a system that's uh, intended to replace uh, the unit system eventually. Uh, the entity system is still under development. It's already in use. We have several things that use the entity system already, like our reflection probes and our um, shaders, shader settings for the level use the entity system. Uh, so it's it's already in use, but it's the plan is for it to eventually complete the interface, uh, the unit system, and that part of the work is still under development. So the the goal of the entity system, uh, why we want the entity system to uh, replace units, uh, I touched a bit on this yesterday, but units work reasonably well in a lot of cases. It's it's a reasonably good solution for representing a game object, uh, but it has some problems. We can't create really super light white units. Um, they always have these arrays of actors, arrays of meshes and stuff like that. It's not possible to create something that is really, really lightweight, which, which is interesting in some situations where you want to really deal with a lot of simple objects. Um, Second problem is that we have limited extensibility. A unit has its list of actors, meshes, and lights, and so on. But we can't add more stuff to it. If we want to add things like splines or particle clouds or, or whatever new stuff that we th can think of that isn't in the engine already, there's no way of adding that to to unit. The only extensibility we have in unit is this uh, script data block, which is a key value store, essentially, where we can store some JSON-like data for the unit that can be used by the script. Uh, but that was originally intended just to store a little health data for the unit, ammo count, maybe some values that the script can access simply. Uh, but since we don't have any other extensibility mechanism, that mechanism has sort of become increasingly abused. Uh, in order to add support for uh, completely new kinds of behavior. Like before we moved the reflection probes to the end of the system, uh, they were implemented through this system. So the reflection probes were special units with, uh, with script data that specified that they were a reflection probe and then we would scan the level to find these units. Uh, but now with the end of the system, we can sort of get away from these kind of hacks and provide real extensibility. Um, another drawback is that the unit system didn't have any kind of inheritance or templating or prefab system. So if we wanted to do things like make a unit that is exactly the same as another unit but red instead, or with make a house that is exactly like another house but with different looking windows, uh, we couldn't set up uh, inheritance between units. We couldn't reuse the setups between units in that way. The only way of doing things like this was to have sort of script configuration where we script or flow could could sort of mod put together a unit or kit it with other unit or reconfigure it in, in various ways. Uh, which is an okay system and works in a lot of cases but it, it's not as general and fle flexible as a as a proper inheritance and prefab system. Um, yeah, as I said, the goal is to, for the entity system to completely replace the unit system in the end. So we will, at some point, we will completely get rid of units. We'll keep them around for backwards compatibility for a while, but uh, the goal is to remove them completely. So what is an entity? Uh, an entity in our system is just an ID. So an entity is no more than an unsigned. It's just 32 bits. And that's what I mean by this system being really, really lightweight. Uh, to represent an entity, we only need these 32 bits. Uh, and these bits are split up in the same way as a unit reference. So 
uh, if you remember from, from yesterday, I said the unit reference is split, split up into index and the generation, and then some uh, marker bits that we can use to distinguish it from a regular pointer uh, when we store it as a light use data in, in Lua. And the entity works exactly the same way. We have 22 bits that we use for the index, so we're limited to 4 million entities right now un until we go to until we go fully to a 64-bit uh, platform. And the generation, uh, which we use 8-bit for, which is used to recycle um, entities at a specific index so that we can uh, distinguish whether we have a new entity created at that index or if it's the same entity as before. Uh, so that lets us know if, if an entity has been deleted or not. Um, so the entity manager uh, keeps track of all the entities exist by storing the current generation of the entity for all these uh, based on the index. So this is a lookup table where you look up based on the index and you find out the current generation. So if you want to know if your entity is alive, you make a lookup in this table with your entity index and you see if your generation matches the generation stored there, then your entity is still alive. Otherwise, your entity has died um, and has possibly been replaced by a new entity at, at that index. So just the same mechanism that we use with the unit reference. Now, the interesting thing to note here is that we don't store any information in the entity itself. So the entity the entity does not have a list of components, it doesn't have a type, it doesn't have anything. An entity is just this, this ID value, uh, which, is, which is really useful because, because it's so small and we can pass it around in Lua without any problem. Um, so the entity manager here is used to create, destroy entities. You can create an entity get back um, one of these numbers with a unique index and generation, and you can destroy an existing entity. And destroying here will just up the generation count in the index slot, since that will indicate that that uh, entity is not alive anymore. And checking if an entity is alive is just simply comparing the generation uh, stored in the entity uh, to the generation stored at the entity's index. So really simple operations. Um, components, entity components are handled by something that we call a component manager. So a component manager is something that keeps track of all, all component instances of a certain type. So we have, for example, a transform component manager that keeps track of the transform component for all the entities in the world. Um, sometimes we are a bit we are a bit sloppy when we talk about this and we we sometimes say just component when we actually mean the component manager because it's kind of uh, annoying to to add manager all the time and sometimes we talk about the components that exist in the entities we talk about those as component instances like an instance of a component in a specific entity and refer to the component manager as just a component. So we're, we're not like 100% um, consistent with, with how we use these terms. But the important thing to know is that we have some class that is, um, some class that is a manager that keeps track of all components of a certain type. Uh, we can look at we can look at the transform component maybe for just to see what it what it looks like. So um, the transform component it has a reference to a world because it it needs to deal with the world, and it keeps track of keeps track of entities um, of the transform for an entity. So you can set the local for a particular. Uh, instance error. Well, I, I should explain what's meant by an instance before showing this. Uh, so I'll, I'll go into that a bit more later. But, but the important thing to know is that the component 
the component in itself, the component that an entity has, that isn't a class or a struct or anything else. That's just an, an abstract thing that the entity has. The classes are the component managers. And they can, they can represent the components in individual component instances in any way they like. They don't have to be actual classes. They could just be ints in an array or something like that. Uh, so because if, if each component was a separate class and separately heap allocated, then we would soon end up in pointer chasing and the whole system would be very inefficient. Um, so the, the component manager is responsible for managing a, a mapping between the entity and the component instances that are owned by that entity. So the actor component, for example, would keep track of the actor component manager would keep track of actor components where each actor component represents an actor in the in the physics world and it would have a mapping so that it knows all the actor components that belong to a specific entity and as i said this this coupling is kind of loose it's only the component manager that keeps track of this it's only the component manager that knows what components belongs to a particular entity the entity itself doesn't have a list of all the components that it owns. So if you want to know what components an entity owns, you have to go and ask uh, all the component manager. You have to ask the transform component manager, like does this entity own any transform components? You have to ask the actor component manager, does this entity act own any actor components? And so on. Um, these components, when, when an entity is destroyed, you naturally want to destroy all the components that belong to that entity. So if, um, if, you, if you destroy an entity that has a lot of actors, then all those actors should of course be destroyed together with the entity. And there are, we have sort of two ways of doing that. Um, either the component can register a callback in the entity manager. So uh, the, the uh, the, see, yeah, it can, it can register a destruction callback with the entity manager. Uh, so if the callback registers this, uh, it says that, well, when this entity is destroyed, I want to be notified so I can destroy all its components because this entity has some components in my system. Um, but it's not necessary to register that. Some components make do with kind of a garbage collection approach to destruction instead. And what I mean by that is that instead of explicitly getting a callback when an entity is destroyed, uh, these components will, will just scan, their, uh, scan the components uh, during the, uh, when the component manager is updated or when components are processed for some other reason and it will check for, for each component is the entity corresponding to this uh, component alive or not and if the entity is dead then it will remove the component and otherwise the component will be there. Uh, we, usually don't garbage, we usually don't scan all the components in the component manager every frame uh, because that takes can take a significant amount of time if there are a lot of components but we can sort of spread this out over multiple frames so we can amortize the cost so each frame we scan like 10 or 20 or whatever is a suitable number some number of components and check if their entities is alive and if the entities are dead we remove the components so so this works well and it's kind of more performant because we don't need to register we don't need to keep track of these callbacks and we don't have to have lots of callbacks happening uh, the main distinction between these two approaches is that when you when you do it by callback um, the component will be destroyed immediately when the entity is destroyed and when we do it with garbage collection it might take a little while before we come to that component before we actually process that component so so the destruction might be delayed a couple of frames from when the entity destroyed. So it depends a bit on the requirements on, of the components. Uh, for some components, it's important that it gets destroyed immediately. For example, for a physics component, we, we definitely want 
We definitely don't want any physics objects that belong to the entity to linger around in the physics world after the entity has been destroyed, because then other physics objects would start colliding with these things that, that no longer should exist. Um, but for some other types of components, it doesn't really matter if the component hangs around a bit after the entity is destroyed. Like the transform component that just keeps track of the entity's position, it doesn't, doesn't matter if that, if that uh, component hangs around a couple of frames after the entity has been destroyed. So in that case, we can use the sort of more efficient garbage collection method. Um, if you saw here in, um, in the, yeah, let me quit slide, so text messages. Um, if you saw here in the entity manager, when we create an entity, uh, we can, we can specify an owner to that entity. And then we have a separate function in the, uh, which is just a void pointer. It could be anything. And then we have a separate function, destroy owned, which destroys all the entities um, that have been registered with this owner. And the reason for this is just to, to not force the user to explicitly destroy every entity. And a typical case of this would be, for example, uh, when you destroy a level. So a, a level when it's, will contain a bunch of entities that is spawned when the level is spawned. And then when you unspawn the level, you want to destroy all of those. So rather than, rather than going through all those entities created by your level one by one, we will just say, well, destroy all the entities um, owned by the level. And the level will be passed in as the owner when the entity is created. So that's just a, a more convenient way of, of destroying multiple entities at once without having to keep track of all of them. Um, yeah, an important thing about the compon component manager is that in the entity system, we, we don't specify that components have, or component instances have to be represented in any specific way. So the component instances don't have to be classes, they don't have to be heap allocated, they don't have to be structs. That's all up to the component manager. So the component manager can lay out the, the data for the instances however it wants. It can move it around in memory and process that data however it wants, uh, which gives a lot of freedom to the designer of the component manager. And that's sort of the idea uh, behind this. We don't want to lock down whoever writes the component manager we don't want them to lock down to represent their data in in a particular predefined way we want them be able to be able to decide that on their own so they can use the most uh, efficient uh, data representation for the kind of processing that they want to do uh, now an, an interesting thing about this sort of loose coupling here uh, the loose coupling that we don't, the entity doesn't have a list of components. Uh, the component manager doesn't have to lay out the data in any particular way. An interesting consequence is that we can kind of create a component manager anywhere. Uh, we can even do it in Lua. So we can, um, we can set it up like this. We can create the Lua class for um, associating Lua data with an entity, we call it Lua data component. Maybe it should be called Lua data component manager, but as I said, we're a bit lax with always adding the manager here. Um, so this allows us to store some Lua data for an entity. So we just have a set data function and that function just stores the data for the entity in the lookup table. And we have a corresponding get data function where we return the data looked up based on the entity. And then uh, to clean out sort of dead data for deleted entities, we, have, we use this garbage collection approach. So in this case, we have an iterator here that is used to walk over this table. And uh, in this case, we only check one uh, instance per frame. You could change this to check more if you want to, but in this case, we just check one per frame. And we check if that, if the entity uh, corresponding to the key in this lookup table 
is not alive anymore, then we'll delete that entry from the lookup table. So here we have sort of implemented a new component in the entity system and it's entirely in implemented in Lua and as you can see it's just uh, 20 lines of code or so. So it's, it's really very easy to, to extend this system and, and you can see how sort of this decoupled uh, the coupled way of representing entities and components makes it really easy to to make your own extensions to the system. Uh, yeah, as I said, a consequence of this decoupling is that we can't enumerate all components of an entity. We have to ask all the component managers. And if you've done it like this, that you have component managers in Lua and stuff like that, then you have to ask uh, the Lua data component here in this case if it has any data for this particular entity. Uh, but usually doing sort of an abstract enumeration of all the components is not, it's not useful. That's why we're, we don't have, we don't like tie a knot on ourselves in trying to, to pri provide an interface that does this because there's really not much you can do with an abstract component. Like if, if we had a way of enumerating all the components, we would get some abstract representation of a component that doesn't really tell you anything. It doesn't tell you, is this an actor component, a mesh component, a, a Lua data component, what is it? To, to do anything useful with a component, you need to know what the component is. And if you know what the component is, if you know that it is a Lua data component, you might as well ask that component directly, do you have any data for this entity? Uh, So, I'm going to continue a bit with how entities are represented in the source data. Um, the most basic kind of entity resource is just a list of components, specifying the components that the entity has and some configuration data for each component. And this resides in a .entity file. So, for a simple case, it might look something like this. We have a list of components. and each component has a type that specifies the type of the component. So the bug name means it's handled by the debug name component manager. Transform means it's handled by the transform component manager. And then there's some specific data for each component, like the transform here has a position, the debug name specifies a name and so on. Uh, the components are identified by a unique identifier. So instead of having array, an array here of the components, we have a hash with, or a map with the a unique identifier as a key. And we do this for two reasons. Uh, one, it's better for merging. Merging arrays is kind of tricky because um, if you're merging array edits from different people, uh, it's hard to know where, uh, what the final order should be, which elements should come before uh, which other elements in the merged array. However, merging uh, maps like this, uh, where the keys or IDs are really simple. If, if the ID doesn't exist in the map, it will create a new entry. If the, if, the, if the ID exists, we will sort of merge the two entries for that ID. So it's better for merging. Uh, and it also allows us to reference these components later. So we can speak about the specific component by specifying its ID, and we will see how that works a bit later. So, uh, so this type, as I said, maps to a component manager, and the rest of the data here is parsed by the compiler for that component manager. Uh, and these compilers are registered in a global registry by some register functions. So if you made a component that if you made a component in a plugins, uh, you have to register its compiler uh, as a compiler for that component type so that the any knows when it compiles the data who's responsible for compiling this data. So each component will be compiled, it will receive this data as an input, it will produce some binary blob uh, representing this data as output, and that binary blob will be uh, part of the compiled entity. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about this later. So this is a basic entity resource, but then we have ways of making this more flexible, more useful, uh, more features, but also a bit more complicated. 
So the first thing that's important to know that we support is child entities. So an entity in this system can have an arbitrary number of child entities. So these are entities that will be spawned together with the parent entity. So when we, when we spawn, the, spawn the parent entity, all its children uh, will also be spawned. So for example, you could have a, a parent entity that is a house, and then you could have child entities that are like the windows and the doors of the house and the chimney. And maybe, maybe the chimney has its own child entity that's, uh, that is the smoke that comes up of the, out of the chimney and so on. So we can create arbitrary hierarchies of entities um, like that. Uh, and these hierarchies, these child entities are kept track of by the transform component. So the transform component has kind of two responsibilities. It keeps track of the position of the entity and it keeps track of the parent entity of the entity. So if we have an entity with some children, its data will look something like this. We will have a component section as before, where we specify the entity's component. And then we will have a list of children. And just as with components, uh, we use a map here instead of an array, uh, where the keys are unique IDs, uniquely identifying each children, so that we can each child, so that we can refer to it later. And so this is the ID of the child, and below that is the entity definition for the child. And the entity de definition for a child is just like any other entity definition. It has its own list of components, and it could have if this if this child had children of its own, there would be a children entry here too. And this would sort of continue like this. Um, and there is there is no limit to the to the depth here. We could have these child entities could have children, and the children could have children, and we could have children of children, and so on to, to an arbitrary depth. Uh, and our plan here is uh, when the entity system is sort of complete and ready to take over, it will replace not only the concept of units, but also the concept of levels. So a level will just be an entity that has a lot of child entities. So an entity will be a regular entity, but with child entities for all the trees and buildings and bushes and grass and whatever else might be placed in the entity. Uh, and so this is kind of a nice, I think it's, it's always, it always feels good in the engine when you can take two different concepts and sort of reduce them to the same uh, single concept uh, because it becomes easier to reason about. Uh, in the old level system we had concept of sub-levels, like you could spawn a level inside another level as a sub-level and with spe special mechanisms for that. That all disappears because of course you can place entities in other entities, that's just how the child entity system works. So that works automatically. We don't need to have separate entity editors and level editors. We just need one entity editor that, that can do everything. So, so it's really nice that it's a nice consequence and I think it shows that the design of this system is on the right track, that we will be able to merge the, the unit and the level concept into a single thing using the entity system. Uh, there's another feature in the entity system, which is reuse. Uh, so, uh, of course, if you create an, an entity that represents a level and you want to have a bunch of trees uh, spawned in that level, you don't want to ent represent each tree as a completely separate entity and enter the and have the separate data for each tree uh, written out every place where the tree is used. Rather, you want to create an a tree template or a tree prefab or whatever you call it and, and reuse that in multiple places in the level so that if you make a change to the tree template uh, all the instances of, the, of that template that has been spawned in the level will be updated. So and you can call this entity reuse, you could call it inheritance or prefabs uh, or whatever. 
And the key concept here is that an entity can inherit another entity. So if an, in, if an entity inherits another entity, it will get all the components and all the children of that entity. So it will start off as being just that entity. But then this entity can add its own components and its own children in addition to those inherited. So in the, in the source file it looks something like this. The entity specifies another entity resource that it inherits from. So this entity will be uh, the same as the box entity, but then it adds its own component. So a component that, that looks like this. So uh, if you use this, if you use this in a level file, uh, the level file would typically be uh, you would have the sort of root entity representing the level, and then it would have a lot of children, and uh, with some ID here. The ID is a GUID, but I, I, I'll just enter some random number, and then the children would typically be. Uh, some inheriting some something something oh sorry blah, blah, blah. inheriting something something uh, like the tree entity and then um, there would be uh, uh, inherits it's kind of tricky typing these up by hand, inherit the tree. So you place a tree in the level, uh, and yeah, and then you would have another, another one of these for another tree placed in the level and so on. Uh, just a long bunch of these for all the, all the things uh, presented in pushed in the level. Um, in addition to adding components to these, these things, that, to these inherited uh, entities, uh, we might also mod want to modify existing components of these. And a typical case, like in this case, when we're creating a level by, by pasting a bunch of objects in it, um, we might want to, uh, we might want to uh, change the position of them because typically in, in the uh, in this parent entity the this thing will have a transform component that just places it uh, in zero 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 but when we put it out in the level we want to place it somewhere in the level so we want to override the transform component uh, so we have a system for this uh, which is inheritance with modification so the way this works is that uh, in addition to a list of components uh, that you add to the entity that you inherit, you can also list modified components. So to modify components, you list its, uh, its ID. So this is the reason why we need another, the other reason why we need ID so that we can refer to existing components of the entity we inherit from, uh, the template or the prefab or whatever you call it. And then you specify those properties that you want to change uh, from this inherited entity. So in the, case, in the case when you place something in the level, um, you would typically specify the ID of the uh, transform component here, uh, whatever that might be, I'll just type something random. And then you would say, well, for this transform component, I'm actually gonna specify a different position it's going to be placed in this position in the level. So that's typically how you would, uh, how it would look for a level where you place out objects in the level. Um, in addition to modified components, you can also delete components. So if the, uh, if the inherited, if the template has some component that you don't want in this particular instance, you can specify that, um, you can specify the ID of those components here and, and then those components won't be included in this instance. And you can do the same thing for the children. So if this uh, template entity has children, uh, you can specify the ID of children that you want, want to modify. Uh, 
And then you can do the same kind of modifications for, the ship, for, for that child. So you can add components, modify components, delete components, uh, add new children or modify existing children of the child component, uh, of the child entity, and so on. And in the same way you can delete children. So, uh, so it becomes kind of, um, I mean, the rabbit hole goes kind of deep. If deeper, you can go to arbitrary level. You can say you modify children, then modify a child of the child of the child of the child, and then go in and modify a component of that child. So you have really a lot of control here in in how the inheritance happens. You can you can basically reconfigure anything of, of the template entity that you inherit, uh, but it can be a bit uh, hard hard on your head once you start to get into multiple levels of this to, to really figure out in your head what is happening, where you are applying the overrides and so on. Uh, but, it, but it all works out and it's a really powerful system for, for inheriting and overriding any property of, of uh, the things that you inherit. Um, so uh, the components in the engine have a common have a common interface um, and as I said above this isn't strictly necessary we could create a completely Lua based component as you saw uh, but for the for the C based for the C based um, components in the engine we have a common interface just to make them uh, easier to work with and some important concepts in that interface is uh, ID and instance. And these are both used to, to identify a specific component instance. So a specific uh, component belonging to a specific entity. Um, the difference between them is that the, the ID is sort of a permanent identifier. Uh, so that's that's a unique ID identifying this component in the entity, and um, it will never change. Uh, but it might be a bit slow to use because because it might require a lookup to find exactly the actual data for this uh, corresponding to this ID. The instance is more like a raw pointer uh, to the data for this component. It's not actually a pointer, it's just an, both of these are just unsigned values. So this is uh, typically more an offset into the, into the actual date component data. But it, but it sort of acts as a pointer in that it points directly to the, to the data for this component, so it doesn't require a lookup. So this one is, is faster to use, um, but it may change between frame to frame because uh, the component manager may decide for efficiency purposes, it may decide to reorder the instances. So it might, if some instance is deleted in the middle of, of the array uh, of components, instead of leaving a hole there, which would make it sort of inefficient to, to go over the data and process it, uh, the component manager may decide to swap components around and move them around. And, and when that happens, the, the instances, these pointers to the component will change but you can still use the ID to, to, look, to look up the component uh, and get to it efficiently. So um, the basic component interface then uh, looks something like this. We have a create function uh, where we specify an entity that we want to create a component for. We get back uh, both a unique ID identifying this component for the entity and an instance. And this is, this is just an optimal, the fact that we get back both an ID and an instance in this case is just an optimization. Uh, we could get back just an ID and then do a lookup to get the instance. Uh, but, uh, but since the create function will actually know where this data is in memory, we can uh, return the instance directly and save the user from doing a lookup. So the lookup is used to, to get sort of this raw instance pointer to the data. So we pass in the entity and the ID of the component and we get the raw instance. And this instance is valid until the next sort of 
garbage collection cycle or the next update performed by this component. So we can look this up once and then we can use the component specific interface which will which will allow us to do stuff based on the instance like for example we can if we have the transform component we might have a set transform operation we pass in the instance and the new transform that we want to set and so on so all the all the functions that actually get their set data for a component they take an instance so we need to look at the id to get the instance typically once a frame to get the, the raw pointer to where the data is currently kept. Um, uh, we can also ask for all instances belonging to a particular entity and get a list of those, or ask for all IDs belonging to a particular entity and get a list of those. Uh, we can destroy the entity, say to the component uh, that we want to destroy the entity, and then it will destroy all the instances belonging to that entity, or we can destroy just one instance uh, belonging to the entity. Uh, we are considering, a change that we are considering right now is to sort of change the create function uh, from returning an ID in an instance to taking an ID, which means that the caller would be responsible for, for specifying the ID. Uh, and that could be kind of nice because then if if you know that the entity has five components, the caller could just create IDs that are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Or you could use, uh, you could use names for identifying uh, the separate instances. Like say, say, say an entity has multiple actors and you could have a name for each actor and the hash of that name would be the ID. And then you could easily do a lookup based on that name uh, to get to an instance. So this is a change we're, we're currently considering and, and will probably make. Uh, as I said, we're still working on this system, but it can be useful to know that we're considering this change. Um, so this is a sort of an interface for, for components that support multiple instances for, for an entity, like the actor component. An entity can have multiple actors or multiple meshes. Uh, but not all compo components support multiple instances. There are some, for instance, a transform component that only support a single instance. So an ent entity can only have one transform. It can only have one position. It doesn't make sense for an entity to have multiple positions. So that's sort of an, so in that case, you would only ever create one instance. And that's uh, kind of an important distinction to know about. Um, Currently in the engine, we sort of have separate APIs for, for these single instance components and multiple instance components. We're kind of treating them differently. Uh, but the plan here is to, to merge these two and only have a single interface like this. Uh, so, so it will be the same interface regardless of whether we support multiple or, or single instances. But in the case of a single instance component, you would only ever call it with a fixed ID, like ID1 or something like that, um, for creating that, uh, that singleton instance. And if it already was created, you would just get back that, that same instance. Um, if we look at how components are implemented, all the, all the components that we support currently in the engine are kind of implemented the same way. They're implemented as a structure of arrays in a single memory block uh, with a structure of array layout. So for the uh, transform component, it looks something like this. So we have all the local transforms uh, for all the instances uh, laid out flat in memory. Then we have the corresponding world transforms laid out in memory. Uh, we have some other data here, like the parent entity and so on, uh, additional data. Then we have these IDs identifying, identifying this component uh, uniquely. And we have previous and next pointers pointing to the previous instance and the next instance, the index of the previous and the next instance uh, of this component belonging to this entity. Now, 
For the transform component, this, this stuff is not really needed since we only have, uh, since it's a single instance component, so we're, uh, we only have one ID for, the ID will always be the same, it's always be one, and we don't need the pre, pre and next pointers uh, because there will only be a single instance for each entity. Uh, but I'm showing there, this here just for completion, so how you, you know how it looks for, um, for the components that, that have multiple instances. And these prev, prev and next pointers, they, they form sort of a double linked list of all the instances that belong to a specific entity. Uh, and the way this works with this, the way we implement the interface above, this, this interface, these functions here, is that the instance pointer will be the index into these arrays. So uh, an instance of two, for example, which means we access this object. And one important thing to note also is that we, we allocate this as a single memory allocation. We don't have, we don't use separate arrays uh, for these things. We just lay them out inside this as, as separate arrays, but inside the same memory block. So that's just for getting a bit more cache performance and reducing the, the number of allocations we make to the memory manager. So that's just a kind of optimization there. Um, the ID here is just a unique number. It's just a counter that we increase every time we uh, create an object. So it's just uh, a unique number that we store for each instance. Uh, uh, then uh, the create function will grow these arrays if necessary, just as with, just as with typical STL vectors or a typical STL array, we will grow these geometrically. So they will double in size when we need more memory. And that's in order to get this amortized uh, constant uh, time allocation cost, which is, uh, which is what we want. So we'll grow the array if necessary, and then we'll find uh, an empty slot for, for this new instance, and we will initialize the data, say that we end up in slot two here. We will in initialize the data here with the default values, and then we will return the ID that we created by increasing the ID number to get the unique number and the instance, which in this case will be two because that's a slot that we, the free slot that we found. So let's create. Um, for lookup, we have a hash map that maps from the entity uh, to the first instance. And so we will use that hash map to look up based on the ID uh, based on the entity, we will look up and we get the first instance, say that this is the first instance, instance one here. Um, then we will look at the ID. Does this ID match um, the ID we're looking up? We're looking up entity ID here. Does this ID match the entity we're looking up? If it does, we're done. We can return one, uh, our current instance. If not, we follow this next pointer to find the next instance for this entity, which might be seven over here uh, somewhere. Then we check the ID of that. Does it match? No. Then we follow the next until we sort of reach the end of this next list. And we continue walking this, this list of instances until we find the one with the matching ID, and then we'll return that one. Um, so this operation can be a bit slow if you have like a thousand instances for the same entity. So that's not usually something that you would want to have. Um, it's not the use case that we really envision, uh, but it's interesting to know. Um, then the, the same for these all function returning all instances or all IDs, they do the same thing. They look up in this hash map and then they follow the next pointer. Just in this case, instead of matching on the ID, we will store all the IDs and return a list of all the IDs. And uh, the destroy function, we will do a lookup to find the instance here that we need to destroy. Then we'll do a swap array, so that, so we'll swap it with the last element of this array. Uh, so the last element will move in here and this one will be deleted. And then we'll need to do some bookkeeping to update the pre and next pointers uh, so that they 
point to the right thing. But since everything is double linked, uh, that's kind of easy to do. Uh, so that that's, takes care of the basic interface. And then we have the component specific interface uh, for, like, for like set local, you pass in an instance and the local. So that's kind of easy. We find the instance in this array. Instance might be two here. And then we just update this local value with the one passed in. Um, so that's basically how you implement a component. Um, compiling entities. So each entity uh, or each component will define a compile function. And the compile function uh, will get an input which represents the sort of merged compile data. So in this case, when we have a sequence of modified components, uh, the compiled data will sort of reference the entire chain of these modifications. So it will point uh, first to this one, which is like the latest uh, modification of this component, and then to the parent uh, where this where this component was initially defined, and that chain might be arbitrary long because we will ha might have inheritance of inheritance of inheritance and modified components in each step. So we will keep track of that entire chain so that when we look up something, let's see how that is done in the actor component here. Go to the compile function. Um, yeah, so in the compile function here, instead of, instead of just looking up the key on a dynamic config value, we have this helper function called get merged key. And what, what that does is that it will look through this entire chain of overrides and return the value for the most recent override. So when we ask this to get uh, the value of the field name, it will return that if that name has been uh, specified in the latest modified components, it will return that. Otherwise, it will go to the inherited, uh, the, the entity we're inheriting from, uh, the template, found, find that component there, and see has the name field been set there. Uh, if not, it will go to the, to the template of that entity and so on until it finds the definition of this field. So, so all of this overrides, overrides and modifications sort of happen automatically. Uh, we don't need to care that much about them in the compile function. We just use these get merge functions um, to look up, uh, to look up fields uh, in the resource as we would do normally. Uh, just in this case, it will go through this chain of modifications and give us the right value. So we look at the fields that we're interested in, name, mass, position, blah, blah, blah. And then we compute some binary data and we pack that, uh, we return that binary data as a buffer. That's the binary representation of this compiled data. So pretty much like uh, the compile functions we saw before when I talked about the data compiler, we take some take some input, some JSON input, produce a binary, a binary blob. The only definition is that we, we use these get merge functions in order to uh, take into account the chain of inheritance and modifications. Um, then there's a corresponding spawn function for spawning the component. The spawn function will be called with a pointer to the compiled data and we'll then create components corresponding to that compile data. So uh, whatever data we output from the compile function, uh, we will get into this uh, spawn function as just a data field here. And then we can process that data and do whatever we need to do. In this case, we're uh, the data are compiled actors, but this is the actor component. So we we create actors and and uh, fill them with that data. Uh, 
So and one interesting optimization here is that the spawn function, it doesn't spawn just one component, it spawns uh, a number of them. So we will actually, when we spawn a level, we will spawn, we will call the spawn function and spawn all the actor components at once. So we'll spawn all the components of one specific type at once. And that's an optimization in order to get better performance where we want to do the same action on a large number of objects and then we we do a, a function for for acting on an array of those objects instead of acting on each individual one. So that's a typical, again, a typical data-oriented uh, optimization. And uh, for spawning the entity that's taken care of uh, by an entity spawner in the entity resource here. So let's see if I can find that thing. So, uh, so this is responsible for creating an entity which, which may have a large number of child entities. It might be a level with like thousands of entities in it. So it's pretty simple. First we spawn the entities themselves. So we call the create um, the entity manager to create the entities. Then we go through the components uh, one at a time uh, and call the, the spawn function for the component to spawn to spawn all the uh, to spawn all the component instances that belong to that uh, specific component. And finally, we do the we do the linking. So we link up the entities to their parents. Um, because we need to wait for the transform component to be spawned before doing that because they depend on that transform component. And finally we have a spawn callback that we call for the entities. If, if some system needs to react on, on the entity being finally spawned, uh, having all its components in place. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, Another entity system that's important to know about is that we have a property system for entities. So the idea behind the property system is that it allows the editor to, or, or an animation system to talk to entities in sort of a general data-driven way. So instead of knowing exactly, exactly what uh, functions a component uh, supports, like the transform component has a set local function and so on, Instead of having to call specific functions, we can use a general property interface instead. So the key, uh, what you do here, you specify the instance you want to set the property for, a key that identifies the property, and the value you want to set it to. And this is kind of a generic interface, so the value can be a boolean, can be a float, it can be a sharp pointer, so that means a string, or it can be a float pointer. Uh, which means just a collection of float values, like a vector three or a vector four or some other float data. And the key here is an unsigned hash of a sequence of key values. So for example, key might be transform position. We would want to change the position component of the transform, uh, uh, of the transform component. And then we would compute a, a key by combining the hash of transform and the hash of position and combining those two hash values in some way and get this unique value. So in the transform component uh, we have code for handling this and the code is pretty simple. Um, it just takes this key that, that we're passed, it compares, compares it against uh, known properties, position, rotation, scale, parent, and so on. And if it finds a match, it will set that property uh, to uh, the data that is passed in, in the value here. And the same applies to getting the property uh, matches and returns the corresponding uh, property value. So, but the, the important thing here is it allows it gives us a way of talking to whatever kind of component we have in the same way. We don't have to know exactly what functions uh, the component supports. We just need to know what the properties are. And how does the editor know which 
properties exist for a particular component, um, that is actually defined in type descriptor files. So that's JSON files that we have on disk that des describes sort of the properties that exist for each uh, entity component. Uh, so another way of doing that, instead of having these type descriptor files, would be to do introspection, which means you would, instead of having like files that define this, you would just ask the engine, you would ask the component and say, oh, what are your, what are your properties? What kind of properties do you support? What values can they have? And so on. And you can discuss whether this is a good or a bad thing. Um, having introspection is kind of... The nice thing about having introspection is that everything is in the same place. Everything, all the knowledge is in the engine. There's not like duplicate knowledge in a file that is stored outside the engine. So that's one point for introspection. Um, disadvantages of introspection. Uh, one disadvantage is that uh, for the editor, you typically want some some more data um, than what the engine wants. You you might want to have some data about what the UI is going to look like and and stuff like that. And it's kind of weird to have to store that data to have the engine know that data. Suddenly, the engine knows what the UI for the editor should be. And since we have this kind of strong separation between the editor and the engine in Stingray. Uh, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense that, that you have to modify the engine in order to change the UI in the editor. Um, another disadvantage of introspection is that uh, you need to have the engine running in order to, to talk to it, in order to ask, to ask it about, about what types exist. So that means, for example, that if you, if you have a crash in the engine for whatever reason, you might have something that causes the engine to crash, some data problem or something, then you can't, um, you can't edit anything in the editor because the editor can't ask the engine for these, uh, since, since the introspection depends on the engine being running, if the engine is crashing and it's not running, uh, then you can't ask the engine for, uh, for the type values and you can't edit the data in the editor. And that can put you in a in a bad situation if if it's like if it's some if it's some entity data that causes the engine to crash, uh, then you can't actually change that data because you can't start the engine uh, to get the uh, to do the introspection to get the uh, the data that you need in order to modify that data from the editor. So it kind of puts you in a trying to lift yourself up by your own bootstrap situation. So yeah, you could. Argue you could argue either way. Like, should is introspection better than having separate files? We sh we've chosen to have separate files, but there are disadvantages and advantages of both approaches. Um, there are a lot of component types already uh, in the engine. I I will just talk about them briefly. I won't go into any detail of them because uh, that would take a long time. There is a debug name component allows us to store a name for debugging uh, with an entity, so you can display a suitable error message. A tag component uh, lets you set uh, an arbitrary number of string tags uh, on an entity, and then you can query the tag component to find all the entities that have a certain tag and, and so on, do that kind of operations. There's a generic data component for storing JSON-like data with an entity, so arbitrary, arbitrary fields of data, um, and also specifying, uh, specifying type descriptors for that data so that it can be edited in the editor. There's a flow component that allows um, uh, flow graphs in entities. There's a render data component for for render data, there's a script component that allows you to add Lua snippets to an entity. Uh, and there's a transform component I already talked about that gives an entity a position, local and world position. Um, so these are all component types that are supported both in the engine and in the editor. We also have some components uh, that are just supported in the engine for now. They don't have an editor interface yet. 
Uh, so these can only be used manually right now, and they're kind of they might be subject to change as as we continue to work on this system. But we have an actor component for representing physics actors, um, animation components for both uh, blenders and state machines. Oh, the unit component is actually in the editor now. So the unit component is sort of an an interface between the entity system and the unit system. It allows a unit to exist uh, in an entity. So that's sort of a, uh, a way to, for us to transition between the systems, to move towards the entity system, but, but still keep backwards compatibility with units. Um, animation components, mesh components for representing graphics meshes, scene graph components for representing the scene graph that I talked about previously in the, in the unit talk. Um, the transform component stores local post, word post, parent entity, parent node. If you, if the entity is parented not on the root uh, of the parent entity, but on a specific node, like parenting a sword to the hand of a character. As I, I talked about this at some length in yesterday when I talked about units. So we, so I won't go into great detail here, but but with entities we've made this change of of not having this late lazy update of the world position. So in the entity system where you do set local, it will actually transform all the children right then and there, which means that the world position is never out of date. Um, this can be costly if you have long chains where all nodes transforms, but that situation is kind of rare. And if, if it should happen, you can implement a custom solution for, for updating all those uh, all those transforms at once. So I think this is uh, a preferable solution. Um, finally, we have some unresolved issues in, in the entity system that we're still working on. I, I think the biggest of those is, is has to do with the editor engine interaction. So uh, the biggest problem there is that the engine and the editor has kind of different views of the entity system. So in the editor and in the source data, we keep track of these uh, inheritance graphs. We keep track of which entities inherit from other entities. And we keep track of these uh, overrides, like modified components, modified children, and so on. But in the runtime engine, after we've compiled, all that data is merged. As you saw, we in the compile function, we get the merge key. So we merged all that down and, and the sort of inheritance relationships no longer exist once we're in the engine. Then it's all flat data, which is great for performance because uh, if, we, if we kept the inheritance, then we would have to follow pointers and find our parents and so on. While as well, we have the data completely flat and memory, we can just process it right away. Uh, but that means that since the engine and the editor have different representations, synchronizing between them is a bit tricky uh, because if a if a parent if a parent entity if an, if a template changes, uh, the engine currently currently doesn't know which instances are using that template, so it doesn't know how to update those instances. So the editor has to do a lot of uh, handwritten sync code right now in order to make sure that that these templates are these template changes are written out just to the entities uh, that care about them. Uh, so, and that's kind of, it's hard to write that code. It's kind of slow for, for the editor to, to keep track of all that. It's easy for bugs to, to appear in this kind of code. So, so we want something else here. We probably want to move to, this, this isn't implemented yet, so this is just speculation, but we probably want to move to using the Delta JSON interface that I talked about when I talked about the asset server. Uh, so we probably want to use that and then not that notification system and have the Endian viewport completely responsible for understanding these Delta JSON changes. So the editor wouldn't have to sort of take care to spoon feed the Endian exactly what it needs, exactly what properties need to change. Instead, the, the editor would just say, well, this entity has changed, this template has changed, and the engine would be responsible for reacting. And the engine, engine could 
default to do a full compile and reload of entities, uh, but we could also add faster paths for the situations where a full compile and reload was, was too slow. We could add faster paths that, that look at the delta JSON and see, oh, this is just a property change. This is just a small property change. I can apply that immediately. I don't have to go through this full compile and reload cycle. Uh, so that way we could probably get to a system where we have a backup system that works for all kinds of changes, but fast paths that work with all sort of slider adjustment and things that you need to do. Um, but this will require the engine to keep sort of the inheritance graph information at runtime so that the engine has some knowledge of what inherits from what and how, how changes to properties should, should propagate down to the entity instance. Uh, but this, this is just speculation. As I said, this is still something that we're working on, finding, finding the right solution for this. Um, so that was everything I had on the entity system. Are there any questions on this? All right. Thank you very much. We'll talk again tomorrow.